Hello and welcome to the 31st episode of this series of Mahabharat. The sages who had accompanied Yudhishthir from Indraprastha continued to stay with him in the forest, causing logistical challenges due to the size of their entourage. With Arjun away on his quest for the Pashupat weapon, a sage named Lomash visited the Pandavas in their abode. Lomash advised Yudhishthir to reduce the size of his retinue before embarking on pilgrimage as it would be cumbersome to travel from one place to another with a large group of followers. The guidance was practical and emphasized the importance of mobility and flexibility during their spiritual journey. Yudhishthir also recognized the challenge of maintaining a large entourage and therefore allowed those who were not accustomed to hardships or limited provisions to return to Dhritarashtra or seek refuge with King Drupad of Panchal. With a smaller group, the Pandavas set out on their pilgrimage to various sacred sites, immersing themselves in the tales and teachings associated with each location. And this phase in their life highlights the importance of learning from the experiences and wisdom of ancient sages during their spiritual journey. And one of the stories they learned was that of the sage Agastya. Agastya was a revered sage and once he encountered ancestral spirits hanging upside down. Upon questioning them, the spirits revealed themselves as his ancestors and expressed their predicament. They explained that without Agastya marrying and having children to perform rituals and offer oblations to them, their lineage would cease to exist. Moved by their plea, Agastya decided to fulfill his duty by getting married and ensuring the continuation of his lineage and the honouring of his ancestors through proper rituals and offerings. And this part essentially emphasizes the significance of honouring and respecting one's family and ancestors in Indian culture. Agastya used his divine powers to create a woman of exceptional beauty and intelligence by combining the most graceful attributes from various creatures. The woman was a perfect blend of beauty drawn from different birds, animals and flowers, symbolizing perfection. Meanwhile, the king of the Vidarbha kingdom, who was childless and distressed, sought Agastya's blessings for a child. In response, Agastya blessed the king, predicting that he would father a beautiful daughter, the same woman that he had created, who would eventually be married to Agastya himself. Soon the queen gave birth to a girl who was named Lopa Mudra. As Lopa Mudra grew up, she blossomed into a maiden of unparalleled beauty and grace captivating all who beheld her. However, despite her allure, no prince dared to pursue her hand in marriage, fearful of incurring the wrath of the powerful sage Agastya. Eventually, Agastya himself arrived in Vidarbha and asserted his claim to marry the king's daughter. The king torn between his daughter's delicate upbringing and the fear of provoking the sage's anger, found himself in a dilemma. He was reluctant to give Lopa Mudra in marriage to a sage who led a simple ascetic life in the forest, yet he could not risk 
defying the will of Agastya. Lopa Mudra, greatly concerned, discovered the cause of her parents' unhappiness and expressed her readiness, not just readiness, her desire to marry the sage. Despite her affluent background and upbringing, she embraced the austere lifestyle of her husband without hesitation. The king was relieved and the marriage of Agastya and Lopamudra was celebrated in due course. When the princess set out to accompany the sage, he requested her to give up her costly garments and valuable jewels. Unquestionably, Lopamudra distributed her priceless jewels and garments amongst her companions and attendants. And she covered herself in deer skin and garments of bark as she joyfully accompanied the sage. While Lopamudra and Agastya were engrossed in their tapas and meditation at Gangadwar, which is an ancient name for Haridwar, a deep and enduring love blossomed between them. However, with time, Lopamudra, being a woman of modesty, felt uncomfortable with the lack of privacy in their forest hermitage for a conjugal life. Finally, one day, overcome with humility and bashfulness, she gathered the courage to express her desires to her husband. She timidly revealed her wish for them to have regal bedding, beautiful robes and precious jewels like the ones she had in her father's home. She also expressed a desire for Agastya to have splendid garments and ornaments. And with this, she hoped they could enjoy life to the fullest. Rishi Agastya replied with a smile, We are mere beggars residing in this forest, devoid of the wealth and luxuries you desire. However, Lopamudra, aware of her husband's divine powers, gained through his austerities, gently reminded him that he possessed the capability to acquire boundless wealth instantly if he willed it. Agastya acknowledged the truth in her words but cautioned that squandering his austerities to amass material riches would only lead to their eventual depletion. Lopamudra expressed her modest wish stating that she only desired that Agastya should acquire an adequate amount of wealth through lawful means to sustain a comfortable life for them. Finally accepting her request, Agastya embarked on a journey as an ordinary sage to seek help from different kings. He approached a reputedly wealthy king and straightforwardly asked for the wealth he needed, emphasizing that it should not harm or disadvantage any others. The king honestly revealed the financial state of his kingdom, explaining the income and expenses and informed Agastya that there was no surplus funds available. Agastya astutely observed that Accepting any gift from the financially strained king would place an additional burden on the already struggling citizens. Thus, he decided to seek assistance elsewhere. The king, acknowledging Agastya's integrity, expressed his willingness to accompany the sage in search of a more suitable place for aid. Their search led them to another kingdom where they encountered a similar financial situation. And Mahabharata explains these things to uh, highlight the importance of fiscal responsibility uh, and not overburdening the populace with with excessive taxation. And Vyas through this whole part of Mahabharata serves for us as a practical illustration of the principle 
that a ruler should govern wisely and not impose heavy taxes on the people beyond what is necessary for legitimate governmental expenses also accepting gifts or making use of the public funds should be done carefully considering the impact it may have on the well-being of the subjects finally agastya decided to seek assistance from the wicked asur ilwal despite knowing his notorious reputation for hating sages Ilwal and his brother Vatapi harbored a deep-seated animosity towards priests and devised a devious plan to eliminate them. Ilwal would extend a seemingly warm invitation to a priest for a feast where he would craftily transform Vatapi into a goat. Subsequently, he would slay the innocent goat serve its meat to the unsuspecting guest and later use his magical powers to resurrect vatapi from the dead and so ilwal would feed the sages with goat vatapi who as food would have entered the vitals of the unlucky sages would spring up sound and whole and rend his way out from their bodies with fiendish laughter and of course killing the guest in doing so in this manner many sages had died ilwal was very happy when he learned that agastya was in his neighborhood and was coming his way since he felt that a revered sage was delivered into his hands by fate unfortunately ilwal's wicked joy at the prospect of ensnaring agastya in his deadly trap was misplaced Despite the asur's treacherous intentions Agastya was no ordinary sage and he possessed immense spiritual power Instead of falling victim to Ilwal's deceitful hospitality Agastya would soon turn the tables on the wicked brothers Vatapi and Ilwal And so Ilwal welcomed Rishi Agastya and prepared the usual feast the sage ate heartily of vatapi transformed into a goat and it only remained now for ilwal to call out vatapi for the rending scene and as usual ilwal repeated the magic formula and shouted vatapi come out to which agastya smiled and gently rubbing his stomach he said oh vatapi be digested in my stomach for the peace and good of the world ilwal shouted again and again and again in frantic fear saying oh vatapi come forth oh vatapi please come out there was no response and the sage explained the reason vatapi had been digested the trick had been tried once too often and thus Agastya wisdom and power thwarted the wicked plans of Ilwal and Vatapi. The asur's deceitful scheme had backfired, leading to their ultimate downfall. This tale in Mahabharat serves as a powerful reminder that deception and evil intentions ultimately meet their match in those who possess true knowledge, virtue, and spiritual strength. The asur humbly submitted to Agastya and gifted him the wealth he sought, allowing the sage to fulfill Lopa Mudra's wishes. Agastya went back and then posed a question to Lopa Mudra: Would she prefer ten normal children or one remarkable child possessing the virtues of ten? Lopa Mudra chose to have one child who was exceptionally virtuous and wise. and so she was graced with a son who embodied all of these qualities and more the story of agastya and lopa mudra essentially is about the importance of a happy domestic life and family life for an overall enriching life on earth and it demonstrates the incompleteness of a life which is based solely on asceticism 
while we are talking of the great sage Agastya, let me end the episode with this incident from the Mahabharata. Once the Vindhyas, the mountain, became jealous of the Meru mountain and tried to grow in stature, kept growing and obstructing the sun, the moon and the planets. Unable to prevent this danger, the gods turned to Agastya for help. The sage went to the Vindhya mountain and said, Best of mountains, stop your growth till I cross you on my way to the south and return north again. After my return, you can grow as you like. Just wait till then. Since the Vindhya mountain respected Agastya, it bowed to his request. The Vindhya obediently halted its growth, waiting for Agastya's return. Agastya did not return north at all, but settled in the south. And so the Vindhyas remain arrested in growth to this day. And this tale from the Mahabharata explains why the Vindhya mountain remains at a standstill. Thank you so much for watching and or listening to another episode of the Mahabharata. We'll see you soon. Thank you.